Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today on SVCC Digital Strategies in the Age of Physical Distancing. I'm Alicia Beyer, and I'm going to moderate the discussion with our three expert panelists today. The challenge of how to conduct effective SVCC among, among the COVID-19 pandemic has really been on people's minds lately. Whether we're working on campaigns around coronavirus or simply figuring out how to continue our already existing important behavior change work that we were doing before the pandemic. So our three panelists today really bring um, important and valuable experience to the table. Their past work developing digital communications campaigns on health issues like Zika and family planning are really great examples of how we can run sophisticated, measurable, and effective campaigns through digital media. Uh, we'll begin with the presentations from each of the three panelists, and then we'll be, it will follow with a question and answer discussion. So please do send us your questions, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Our first presenter today is Kate DeRocher from Apt Associates, who will tell us uh, about her the, an innovative Zika campaign that she worked on in 2016 and 2017. So over to you, Kate. Thanks, Alicia. I think um, it's hard to believe that it was really only a few years ago, you mentioned back in um, 2016, that many of us here at APT and actually the news media was focused on a different virus, and that was, of course, Zika. And, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC here in the United States, was recognizing the public health emergency that was posed by Zika, especially the adverse effects that it was having on pregnancies. And in response, the CDC launched a comprehensive communication initiative that APT supported to inform the public about the risks of Zika, both here in the continental U.S., but also in Puerto Rico, with a focus on protecting pregnant women. So, next slide. And you can imagine that there were a number of questions that we were asking ourselves. The first really being, how do we get out ahead of this rapidly spreading virus so that we can quickly reach our audience? Um, but there are more questions, and kind of the questions that started keeping us up at night as time passed and the virus continued was, how are we going to combat the complacency that's likely to set in with our target audience? And, and some of the other questions that we're always asking ourselves with communication campaigns is, you know, how can we be sure that our messages are resonating with our audience? And, you know, how do we know if our audience is changing their behavior and taking that preventative action? So, next slide. The first thing. Um, that we did was really understand who is our target audience. Um, and the focus here was on protecting pregnant women or women planning to become pregnant um, and their partners. Um, and so working with our media partner, we really dug into some existing national research to understand who the audience was and really to know where we could reach her. So we used existing sources like GFK MediaMark Research, um, Comscore, Nielsen, um, to see where our audience was consuming content. And that would allow us to know where we really needed to place our messages. So we broke our audience into different age segments you can see on this slide. And, and what we found really across all of the, the age groups was there was such a high media usage of digital and mobile across these groups. And honestly, that was very promising because if you go back to that original question about how to respond quickly, we knew that digital strategies were likely our best option for having a really rapid response. And a quick caveat here is that I'm, I'm speaking specifically to our U.S. audience, but um, we also had audiences in Puerto Rico and travelers in the U.S., and I by no means want to suggest that when looking at your target audience, one size fits all. So this is really specific to the U.S. Um, next slide. So once we had that knowledge of where our audience was um, consuming content, we created a research-driven media plan. So you can see in our pie chart. And um, the majority of our tactics really involve digital platforms. So things like display media, that would be the banners that you might see on a website um, and some of the um, digital videos or, or use of social that would be available on digital platforms. And digital wasn't our only tactic, um, but you know, when presented with these insights and this knowledge and research that we had done, it was very clear that, that digital was the place we wanted to start. 
And, and digital allowed us many other benefits. So I mentioned that rapid response that, that digital had. That was so important in our campaign in the US specifically, um, because we were geographically targeting messages to outbreak areas. And using digital, we could turn on the, the messages. We could have our message in a specific location. Um, honestly, almost as quick as 24 hours, right? If there was an outbreak, we could have that message um, available digitally. And that's something that we just couldn't do with a billboard. Um, so digital allowed us to do that. It also allowed us to really pinpoint our messages geographically, um, even down to the zip code of an area that was having an outbreak. And what was so important about that is that it allowed us not just to flood a message in an area that it wasn't needed, but we could spend our resources um, where they were needed most. And that's something that we all encounter. Um, digital also helped us in our message development process. Um, and very specifically in Puerto Rico, where we were able to analyze the audience's use of social and digital media to better understand which messages were resonating and which preventative actions that the audience would undertake. Um, it was a great tool for us to, um, to gather that, that information. So I mentioned we did use some other tactics like billboards and posters. And even within those tactics, we tried to make those as geographically targeted as possible. And not just in the, the national geographic area, but even when we placed posters in malls, we tried to make sure that those were near maternity stores where, where they'd have the biggest impact and the most likely to be seen by our target audiences. Um, we also made public service announcements through radio spots, and we did do those terrestrial, um, which gave us kind of a, a, a wider geographic area. And we overlaid um, that with digital so that we were able to do more pinpoint targeting. So really the bulk of our plan was digital media. Um, and so on this slide, you can see the different tactic examples. Um, one thing that we did across any of our tactics was we used the same preventative actions. And, and we took the tactics themselves as different ways to share this message. So, um, for example, on social media, we were able to use some of the, the media formats. So specifically on Facebook, we were allowed to use formats that didn't just talk about one preventative action, but allowed us to expand the unit to see multiple. So we might be talking about using insect repellent, but it also gave us a form that we could talk about also another action, like removing standing water. Um, in video, you can go a little bit into more detail. So it isn't just about removing standing water, but you could show people where um, to find standing water, how to remove standing water. So really using that um, format to the most of its ability. And um, we use search, and we use search not just for people who are looking for Zika information, but we use search and found keywords that people might be searching up um, on Zika symptoms. In, in any of the results, we allowed users to click to the CDC web pages for more information. And we also use digital spy in an, an interesting way, something called retargeting. And um, that uses the mobile devices location services. So we were actually able to see um, if somebody had gone into a maternity store and kind of checked into a maternity store, and we knew that through location services, we were able to, to target a message to them afterwards, so to retarget that ad and make sure we, we reached our target audiences. We also did that with travelers. So we knew people had gone through airports that um, had high level of traffic in Zika outbreak areas and were able to message specifically to those people. And um, next slide. So how did we evaluate and monitor the campaign? Well, our team selected two models to anchor our monitoring and evaluation, the precaution adoption process model, um, as well as the social media metrics map, which I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. And we used a number of ways that, uh, to gather information to inform the evaluation um, and throughout to monitor the campaign. I'm really gonna focus on the first two, the digital media and the behavior intent studies, and mainly because those are more readily available digital tools. But we did also throughout do um, random digit telephone surveys, as well as looked at consumer sales data. Next slide. So one of the nice things, if you've worked with digital media, and I will say sometimes overwhelming things, uh, is its ability to capture performance information. Most of our media um, analytics were compiled and analyzed through something called Tableau, which is a great 
data visualization tool that helps us measure our progress and performance. You can see a snapshot of it um, here. And we were able to aggregate our digital media sources, including so any of the sources from Facebook or from Google, and, and also the CDC's website. So we were able to look at activity and once people clicked on to get more information. And Tableau allowed us that one place to look at that information. Um, and we could see it in so many different ways. We could look at it by week, by month, type of advertisement, location, um, you know, which geographic area and how was it performing. Um, you can see on this, this is really just our, our highest level snapshot, looking at impressions and click by the different tactics and the amount spent. But there are ways to drill down so that we could look at the preventative action and where was it having the, um, the best response and on what platform. So, so many different ways to really dig into that data. Um, and we paid attention throughout the campaign to kind of understand what the audience was doing. That helped us understand whether or not, you know, the audience was having slower reaction to things, if there was potential complacency with our messages. Um, and it, it also allowed us to see how we were performing against industry benchmarks, um, and not just all industry, but government-sponsored campaigns. And that really gave us a more objective view of our performance. The next slide. And I mentioned we use the social uh, media metrics framework, the MAP framework for our monitoring and evaluation. And this is very similar to stage theories in that it's composed of five stages um, that an individual must pass through to get to the desired outcome. So there's awareness, consideration, decision, adoption, and advocacy. And due to the time and resources, we focused on the first three stages for this framework. Um, and one of the benefits of this model, as you can kind of see, is that it really relies heavily on the available campaign metrics that I just talked about. And um, so there is awareness, which addresses the audience's is exposure to the campaign content. Um, and that was measured by things such as the number of our placements and the, the total impressions that we had. Um, for consideration, um, that's really the step where the audience starts to engage with our campaign. And we measured that with um, engagement like likes and shares. Um, and finally, the goal of the campaign, which was really to end up to drive traffic to CDC's websites for more information. So clicking on the link to the website really represented our decision stage, that to seek further information and ultimately take an action. Next slide. So another of the ways that we work to show um, the move toward action was through behavior intent studies. So we did two studies, um, the Google Health study as well as a Nielsen study, and these were online surveys of control and exposed groups. So people who had been exposed or seen our digital ads and those who weren't. And respondents were prompted to report if they had seen advertising for Zika and then to indicate how likely they were to take the preventative action. And this was how likely are you to use insect repellent. Um, and with Google, we did something that was, that was interesting. We were able to also measure whether people who had been exposed to the ad were more likely to then search on um, Zika-related terms. So did they have an additional action where they went into Google after having seen our ads um, you know, and search for something related to Zika? And Facebook was a little bit of a different uh, approach. We used the same media types that we'd been using in our campaign, um, and we posted messages that prompted users to use Facebook's like button to indicate their intent to take action. So, you know, if, if you um, intend to use repellent, click like. And then performance was measured through the engagement. So we looked at whether people did like, if they shared it, if they commented, or even if they went to CDC's website for more information. Next slide. So what we learned, well, our campaign ran between spring of 2016 and summer 2017, and we were able to reach 37 million people in the United States and Puerto Rico. And I think, you know, we did this, learned that, you know, it's a really a mixture of strategies that allowed us to have this high saturation of our message and really reach our different audiences. In all, I think we had 370 creative units that we used, so with all of our different tactics, and um, I think we also learned that when buying uh, digital media, 
you can buy it in a number of different ways. And we found that when working directly with a site or a social media influencer, we often gained a kind of what we call earned media or free media. Um, and that was wonderful because that kind of extended our overall reach and our, our buy. Um, but we also found that working through um, digital networks like the Google Display Network, we, uh, we were able to have a lower cost for our overall impression. Um, we learned that social media, which I, I talked about, um, social media gave us great insights uh, from our audience, and it really impacted the creative that we use in our creative development. Um, and then I think lastly, being very creative with the media formats, like retargeting that I mentioned, or using Facebook format to um, measure intent, like that was really great to strengthen our campaign, and it made it as relevant to the audience as possible. And that's it. Great, thank you very much, Kate. Um, it really, it's really striking to think about how the Zika campaign is, is so relevant for lessons learned under COVID-19, and you talked about how to combat complacency as time goes on and to continually engage the audience. Um, it's also really interesting to hear about how you planned the monitoring of your campaign uh, ahead of time, and you designed data visualizations with Tableau so that you can, you know, observe, adapt as you go along. So really in interesting lessons there. Um, <clears throat> our next presenter is Emily Mangoni. Uh, Emily. Emily is a senior associate at Apt Associates, and she'll be presenting on work in Haiti and in India uh, through the Shops Plus project. Shops Plus stands for Sustaining Health Outcomes Through the Private Sector, and it's a USAID flagship initiative in private sector health. So over to you, Emily. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thanks again for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to be speaking today about our work on the Shops Plus project, which is USAID's flagship project for private sector health implemented by Apt Associates. Next slide, please. So I'm going to be talking about digital approaches that have helped Shops Plus implement our behavior change campaigns in India and Haiti. So a very different context from uh, domestic uh, US context. And these case studies are going to highlight how our digital approaches have been successfully applied across these low and middle income settings and in diverse health areas. Uh, particularly in developing country settings, we know most of the consumption of digital content is via mobile phone. So I'm gonna describe two digital strategies that were successful in finding our key audiences on their phone. Uh, in India, I'm going to focus on the use of social media in the context of their greater BCC campaign. And in Haiti, I'm going to focus on the use of mobile messaging. I'm going to present both case studies and then provide cross-cutting lessons at the end. Next slide. Uh, I would like to start with our case study from India, which has very much been at the cutting edge of the use of digital strategies to extend the reach and enable the impact of our campaigns. As of 2018, India had 1.2 billion mobile phone subscriptions and 560 million internet subscribers. It also has incredible 4G national coverage of over 80%. So as a leader in smartphone adoption, it's really fitting that our program there leverages social media as our key communication channel. So family planning, um, as a first step in our communications programming, we identified our core problem statement and for family planning, which was one of our health areas, um, an identified barrier was negative perceptions and fear of side effects um, that really led to a decline in the use of oral contraceptive pills. Next slide. In the context of this problem statement, Shops Plus India defined its target audience as 18 to 29 year olds who were married, urban, and low income. And so to precisely target this group, um, we, we took an approach that was similar to what Kate described. We focused on the age group, gender, and geography, and used data from social media sites and other sources. We didn't always have income information, um, but we were also to, we were able to further refine this targeting based on proxy information, such as whether the individual had low-cost mobile phones, what their profession was, and even what TV series they preferred. 
So we used a lot of different sources to target our group. For family planning, our objective was to target um, or to position oral contraceptive pills as a contraceptive of choice for couples who want to delay childbirth but maybe want a child in the future, um, and also to encourage women to look beyond misinformation. Next slide. Um, we also used a stages of change framework to generate awareness, interest, desire, and action, and really move people through that funnel. Um, mass media and social media um, are, tend to be used to make consumers aware of our health products and services. The social media can then micro-target those audiences through Facebook and YouTube to generate interest and develop an appreciation for the product or the message, like our oral contraceptive pills. Um, and then other tools such as chatbots and counseling helplines uh, that we'll talk a little bit about later uh, can personalize that health information even further and really move people towards action. In fact, uh, calling a helpline could really be considered an, uh, taking some action. Next slide, please. So Shops Plus India built this holistic ecosystem of digital and non-digital BCC channels, and they all work together to reinforce the messages, again, to move people from awareness to action. Um, and one of our most successful approaches was our 360 digital and social media campaign. Um, but again, I want to note that the social media campaign was complementary to a broader mass media campaign and on-ground effort. So digital it really was one component of a greater campaign. It was a really important and powerful component, though. Next slide. So for the digital campaign, we used websites, banners, advertisements um, to really respond and cater to a search engine audience. Um, we sponsored content there. Uh, we then sort of re replayed our, our content through YouTube videos to create awareness through our video marketing. Uh, we partnered with influencers to extend the reach of those TV commercials. Um, and our social media strategy really relied on content seeding, uh, which is a strategy to plant our, our brand, our content across various platforms. Um, so we would partner with an influencer to, to promote our products through their channels and thereby reach their target audiences and attract additional leads um, and it, it can be, depending on who you partner with, it can be really mutually beneficial um, to do this cross-promotional activity. Uh, we also used Facebook, of course, uh, to amplify branded content, acquire our audience through additional ads, and we used polls and contests to be engaging with our audience. Um, and we integrated Facebook with our chatbot, uh, which provided more tailored and private information on sexual health. Um, and then from there, you could even uh, be connected to uh, the helpline. And uh, throughout this, we used Facebook Pixel software to create custom audiences um, from our website visitors and to automatically show um, our audiences tailored content based on previous content that they consumed. So again, just trying to uh, reframe and amplify our messaging. Um, Facebook Pixel also helped us uh, measure the impact of our messages. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, you can all check out our chatbot called hellojuby.in, um, and this is an artificial intelligence chatbot which answers common questions about reproductive health. Um, it's in English and in Hindi. Um, it really ensured private conversations for those seeking more information, um, and it, it's really this fun sort of casual interaction. Um, so I have a screenshot here, but that was uh, a key part of our digital strategy. Um, and uh, that was very well received. Next slide, please. So to sort of bring us back to that uh, stages of change funnel, so we reached 43 million people through our mass media campaign and an additional 5.5 .5 million through social media. This was really to generate that awareness. Um, and this was really helped by the adoption of our materials by actually the government of India, um, who, who were able to amplify the messages around um, family planning and OCPs. Um, and then, so for the, we tried to generate more knowledge, so we looked at total minutes of videos consumed um, and engagement with, um, with social media. Um, and uh, the, that would then lead them to taking action with our chatbot, calling the helpline, and we ultimately did a reach and recall survey, um, similar to what uh, Kate had described, and we asked people whether they 
um, would consider OCP use, plan to purchase OCPs, et cetera. And we found that 41% um, of people who had heard a campaign messages, uh, message did indeed plan to take some sort of action. So that was really exciting to sort of measure that impact through um, a holistic campaign. So I want to move, next slide please, great. Uh, I want to move on to Haiti, totally different context, obviously. Um, so Haiti has a mobile penetration of 61%, so that's unique subscribers as a proportion of the population. Big difference in Haiti though, is that they only have 19% penetration for internet and active social media users. So we really had to take a different approach here. So we leveraged a mobile messaging approach that only required a basic mobile phone. Um, and it's that that I'm going to describe today. Next slide. We also had a much different problem statement in Haiti. So Haiti is routinely confronted by a confluence of health and humanitarian disasters or crises, um, high maternal and child mortality, low family planning use, uh, earthquakes, hurricanes, and of course, Zika as well. So really broad problem statement. Next slide. Uh, so our target population um, broadly was women of reproductive age 15 to 49 with or without children, obviously a huge proportion of the population. Um, and we had a lot of different messages to provide to a lot of sub, um, subgroups of, of women and families and um, parents. Um, these could be on uh, Zika prevention for pregnant women, hurricane safety, water and sanitation for cholera prevention, and of course, all of those messages on family planning and maternal and child health. Next slide. So as in India, Shops Plus Haiti used a variety of digital and non-digital channels to reach our audiences. We developed radio dramas to inform, sensitize, and educate. Everybody in Haiti has a radio, very high prevalence. Um, and then we moved to our digital campaigns. So we used uh, blasts of text messages to also raise that awareness um, and knowledge. So um, for example, we sent out um, hundreds of thousands of, or actually millions of messages to people post, uh, post hurricane. Um, we also developed an on-demand interactive voice response hotline um, so people could call and get information um, when they needed it. Um, and then we created a voice mailbox where people could call um, with questions, um, and we used that to refine our content. Um, and then, of course, we used Facebook, um, and we did Facebook Live events with providers to really uh, increase that engagement. So just to sort of next slide, to focus a little bit on that mobile messaging component. So again, um, that on we partnered with uh, Viamo, who you'll actually hear from next, and we initiated conversations with mobile network operators in Haiti. And so this on-demand interactive voice response hotline is similar to when you might call a bank and they say, press one for more information. So it was that type of experience. Um, and it was free and, and people who called could choose from an audio menu of different health topics, such as child health messages, Zika, et cetera. Um, and then um, we could also push out text messages to beneficiaries. Uh, we did this both on a routine uh, sort of scheduled basis, uh, but we also did it um, on, you know, after hurricanes, before hurricanes, for condom awareness days. Um, and we reach, reached, you know, hundreds of thousands of people through this push messaging. Um, and we also, again, had that voice mailbox, which allowed us to pull, receive these questions and requests for additional content. And we could adapt and tailor our digital content um, as, as we went in real time. So that was really helpful. Uh, next slide. So again, using the framework, um, we, the radio drama and SMS blasts were our primary strategies for increasing awareness on health topics and increasing the visibility of both our message and other, our other digital channels. And then our IVR on demand channel and Facebook live events helped create that desire, engage the audience and push them towards action. Next slide. 
Uh, for digital engagement, here are some quick statistics. So our Facebook page reached about four, uh, two and a half million people. Um, our SMS blasts reached over 200,000 people. Um, and we also had about 100,000 unique callers who are making about 400,000 calls to our on-demand IVR system. That's about four calls per person. And you can see in the graph that um, over half of that those calls were accessing family planning content, followed by water and sanitation and cholera content, and after that, Zika content. We got over 100,000 questions in our issue tracker voicemail box, which is uh, quite a feat to parse. Um, and then we had also actually set up a unique uh, SMS system for uh, contraceptive message uh, messages um, for reminders. Um, and so we had about uh, a little under 7,000 women registering for that. And so with our SMS messages too, we, we would push out quizzes so we could better understand who our audience was. Um, we could add those groups to, to subgroups to receive different types of content. Um, and so it was a really uh, helpful two-way system. So here are some quick lessons learned um, on our, from our digital SBC campaigns. Next slide. Ecosystem. So I think throughout India and Haiti, uh, we found that digital approaches are most effective when they are complementary to a multi-channel strategy. Um, so digital um, can really have great reach, as you can see with Facebook in India when there's tons of smartphone subscribers, when you're blasting out SMS, but digital also allows us to do a more personalized uh, and tailored um, engagement and so increase our impact. It sort of bridges mass media and on-ground efforts. Um, and we found that it was really beneficial to have this as one of our of our multiple strategies. So again, digital isn't one isn't the solution, it's really part of the solution. Uh, partnerships. Um, so Shops Plus is a private sector project. And so of course throughout our engagements in India and Haiti, we partnered with private private sector. So, um, and we found that this could increase our visibility, credibility, and impact of our campaigns. For example, in India, um, we partnered with MTV to develop our radio dramas. Uh, we also partnered with Dr. Reddy's, a pharmaceutical manufacturing company, to, um, so that was for our, our child health campaign. Um, and we partnered with uh, private providers to do a lot of our work um, for the Facebook Live events. And these were really mutually beneficial partner, uh, partnerships because uh, there was opportunities for cross-promotion of branding, um, and they could use our channels to increase their visibility. Um, so there's really a win-win situation, and those are what we're looking for when partnering with the private sector. And in Haiti, uh, we really tried to partner with the mobile network operators. We had some mixed success there. Um, it, we found that when there is a more competitive environment, so there's a lot of mobile network operators, the mobile network operators are a little bit more willing to negotiate and partner, whereas where, when there's just one dominating a country like in Haiti, uh, they have a little bit more leverage. So uh, it really depends on who the market is, but it's really important to understand who the players are in that market um, and partner for your digital channel. Next slide, please. Data, so uh, this seems like a no-brainer, but there's data everywhere. Data is collected by those mobile network operators. Um, it's collected by social media, websites, um, and often people will just use it initially to uh, segment their audiences, but you can also use it continuously um, to revise and tailor content to subgroups within your audience. And that's what we did um, both with our social media strategy in India and with our mobile messaging content in Haiti. Next slide. Um, finally, digital does, of course, have some limited, uh, oh, sorry, we're on cost. Um, so cost, I think people often say, oh, digital's really cheap, right? You just create a Facebook page, not expensive at all. Um, and, but it really can have varying costs, um, though it does provide a good return on investment. So an SMS might be just one cent to send one SMS, but when you're trying to reach millions of people with, you know, 10 messages, that can really add up quickly. Um, and then we also found that um, developing Facebook and social media campaigns required a lot of effort spent on really short, intense 
co uh, content. So I think there's, there are some hidden costs there, but again, it can be really um, a good return on investment and it's really a good opportunity to make it more personalized. And finally, limitations. Um, di uh, digital approaches do depend on infrastructure and phone ownership, um, which is why it's criti really critical to know your setting and know your audience. Um, who are you going to be targeting? What types of phone do they have? Um, understand that there is you know, a digital divide, which means uh, some people have access to phones and some don't. These are often along urban and rural lines, male gender lines, um, indigenous population lines. Um, so it's really important to, to not just do digital because it's exciting and, and seems innovative, but to understand whether it's the best strategy for reaching your audience. And with that, I'd like to close. Thank you for your interest. Thanks so much, Emily. So, so many lessons to, to think about. And I think, you know, a couple things that struck me. One is that your, in both cases, your campaigns were very holistic. So digital wasn't the only um, media channel, but it was a multi-channel approach. And I think also, you know, your partnerships with the private sector are so interesting when we're thinking about efficient and sustainable uh, social media, uh, sorry, um, digital media strategies, and really in leveraging existing brand equity of private of the private sector to drive traffic to your campaign. Um, there's a lot more there, but we'll we'll move on. And I just wanted to remind people on that note that we we are taking questions, and we encourage people to write your questions in the chat box as we go. We'd really love to hear people and have an engaging session, Q&A session at the end of this. Um, okay, so um, let's see. Our next presenter is Emma Satchin. Emma is the Deputy Director of Partnerships at Viama, and she'll be speaking to us about the millions of people that Viama has reached through the 321 service line. Um, and App Associates works a lot with Viamo on a number of projects. So over to you, Emma. Great. Thanks, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm excited to share a bit about the mobile SBCC solutions that Viamo uses to reach people around the world with actionable information. Next slide, please. So to kick things off, for those of you who are not familiar with Viamo, we are a global social enterprise. We have offices in about 25 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. And our core belief really is that information is power. We envision a world where all people have access to the information they need to make decisions for healthy and prosperous lives. And we do this by powering two-way communication at scale between organizations and the people they hope to serve. We excel at increasing access to information by optimizing content for mobile. So we can reach audiences on devices that they already own, on channels they're already familiar with, and in a language that they understand. We work across all development sectors, and like Emily and Alicia noted, we have a great partnership with apps. We've collaborated with them over the years on a number of USA projects like IHP and DRC, ECHO in Mozambique, and of course, Shop Plus in Haiti, as Emily mentioned. Next slide, please. A quick overview of how we work. Um, all of our processes are rooted in human-centered design. And at Viamo, we really think of ourselves as digital strategy advisors, uh, a tech partner, a communications channel. And then we view our development partners, like Apt, as the content experts. So we work hand in hand with our partners to design content, which we then optimize for mobile, ensuring that the content is culturally contextualized and relevant, of course, translated and recorded in local languages, field tested quite extensively, and iterated multiple times before it's shared. And then we supply our partners with real-time monitoring so we can see the impact of the information being shared. Next slide, please. The first SBCC solution I'd like to talk about is called the 321 service. The 321 service is a free on-demand information service that's accessible on any mobile phone, even the most basic phone. In order to access information through this service, mobile subscribers can call a toll-free short code, like 
three, two, one. And then they're able to listen to pre-recorded audio messages on a variety of topics. We leverage the power of interactive voice response here so we can overcome barriers like literacy, distance, infrastructure, and language to make sure that the information on the service can be accessed by as many people as possible. So when a caller dials into 321, they'll hear a menu of options, and they can choose to listen to messages about topics like health, agriculture, civic engagement, financial services. And in addition to static content, like how, what are the symptoms of malaria, uh, we can also host dynamic content, weather, news, localized information, gamified content. Um, and this has proven incredibly popular on the service. If you are interested in hearing the messages, on 321, we've connected Uganda service, which is known as 161, to a US number, which is listed here. So you can hear what's being hosted on Uganda if you're in the United States. Next slide, please. The 321 service is currently available in about 19 countries, and we're able to host the service due to our relationships with mobile network operators. As you'll see on this map, we have a local mobile network operator who serves as a partner in each of the countries where we host this service. And these mobile network operators provide the service free of charge to their subscribers. So for instance, if you're a subscriber to Airtel in Uganda, you can dial into 321, listen to the messages, and that call won't use any of your airtime or data. If you combined all of the subscriber bases for these mobile network operators, 321 is technically accessible to about 200 million people. So it's a really incredible reach. And last year, these partners donated about 380 million airtime minutes, which equates to a retail value of about 75 million US dollars. Each year, more and more people are calling into 321. We're working with more and more partners to add new content in each country. And last year, over 6.4 million listeners listened to more than 67 million messages globally through this service. Next slide, please. To illustrate the power of this solution as an SBCC tool, I have a few examples to show how we've been using 321 to support behavior change. The first example is especially relevant and still evolving, and that's our work with the COVID-19 response. Uh, when the pandemic hit, Viamo very fortunately was well positioned to quickly and efficiently disseminate trustworthy information about COVID-19 on the 321 service. So in the beginning of March, we started working to get very basic COVID-19 information validated. Whenever we host content on 321, it has to be approved by the relevant governing body. So we started with very basic WHO information about the virus. What is coronavirus? What are the signs and symptoms? How does it spread? How do I protect myself? And once that was approved, we started working with local partners to adapt this information, uh, make it more context specific. So for instance, we're doing daily bulletins in Burkina Faso. And in Nigeria, we have a news partner who's providing daily COVID-19 updates. We've added gamified content on COVID-19 in some countries. And we've been exploring other ways to share reliable situation updates. As of May 22nd, over 5.9 million people have listened to about 44 million minutes of this COVID-19 content on the 321 service. Next slide, please. Another example of how 321 can support behavior change and allow target audiences to take an action is through referrals. Uh, in Tanzania, we worked with our partners at CCBRT. They're the largest local provider of disability services in the country. And alongside Vodacom Tanzania, our mobile network operator partner, we developed a set of messages for the 321 service on obstetric fistula. CCBRT has a disability hospital in Dar es Salaam, and they provide transportation and treatment for fistula at their hospital free of charge. So we wanted to make sure that as many people as possible knew not only what fistula was, but that it's a treatable condition and that CCBRT would be able to treat women with symptoms for free. So in coordination with the clinicians at CCBRT, we developed a set of messages about fistula and got them approved by the Ministry of Health. We then actually had the Vice President of Tanzania record the messages. And when we hosted this content on 321, we had to think carefully. Uh, fistula is highly stigmatized. Not a lot of people know what fistula is. So we decided to label it under a category called complications after birth. This is a category of 321 that usually receives a high volume of listeners. So we knew that a lot of people were listening to messages under this category. And if you called into 321 and listened to complications after birth, 
you would hear the fistula messages and also be referred to CCBRT's fistula hotline, where you could speak with someone if you thought you had fistula symptoms or if you wanted to learn more information. In about a three-month implementation period, there were over 300,000 calls to the service that listened to these fistula messages, which prompted over 1,000 referral calls made to CCBRT's fistula hotline. Next slide, please. The next SBCC solution I wanna share is remote training, which is also relevant with the new protocols and rules around social distancing. VMO can optimize training curricula for the mobile device and deliver training through different methods like voice, SMS, or chatbot for different type of workforces, uh, community health workers, teachers, community leaders. And we break up each curriculum into learning modules. Most commonly, we've been delivering them through voice as calls. Um, so calls usually last several minutes long, and we can build in comprehension questions to make sure that trainees are participating and allow for partners to check for understanding. Next slide, please. We originally piloted this training service in 2018 and 2019 in Rwanda. Every April, unfortunately, Rwanda sees a pretty significant spike in mental health cases at their healthcare facilities around the anniversary of the genocide. And the Ministry of Health was particularly concerned about the extra media attention around the 25th commemoration of the genocide. So we collaborated with them and Johnson & Johnson to optimize a mental health training for Rwanda's community health workers. The country has just over 50,000 community health workers and the ministry had all of their phone numbers. So we had the Minister of Health himself record the learning modules, which cover topics like PTSD, uh, how to identify symptoms, how to refer patients with depression for treatment. And these were pushed out as five minute long voice recordings twice a week in the lead up to the anniversary with comprehension questions built into the end of each module. And we found that this was a low cost, measurable and really effective way to provide additional learning support to dispersed workforces. Next slide, please. So what has BMO learned about the power of mobile for SBCC? Uh, we really believe that no communications channel has a larger reach than the mobile phone. And IVR is a very powerful tool that can allow us to practically reach anyone with a mobile phone. Uh, leveraging the power of voice can help us overcome really common barriers and ensure a more inclusive feedback loop. So not only are we sharing as much information with as many people as possible, but they're able to respond. We've also learned a lot about the content we support. Is it tailored? Is it localized? We found that the more dynamic the content is, the more engaging it is. And of course, we want the content to be actionable and make sure that the person who listens is able to take an action. Another big lesson is that while well, you need buy-in from relevant stakeholders, having their endorsement makes a huge difference. It validates and legitimizes the work and the information being shared. And of course, the measurability of digital SBCC is a real game changer. We can adjust and adjust services in real time to make sure we're delivering the right information to the right people at the right time. And that's all from me today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emma. Very interesting stuff. I think, you know, the 321 line is really, uh, you know, can reach many people at scale. And I think that uh, when you're looking at things like fistula and COVID-19, you, you're really focused on that knowledge, that first step in behavior change. And that's a very uh, good channel to reach many people with those basic knowledge messages. So um, we're about to go over to questions, but before we do that, I just wanted to wrap up with three key takeaways that I've noticed in these presentations. One is that uh, digital strategies really enable us to identify and then target audiences and then reach them. So in traditional SBC, we're often able to clearly identify our target, but we struggle with how to find them, and digital enables us to do that. Um, so I think we've seen that in the presentations today, but we also saw that they have multi-channel approaches. So it's not really digital or something else, but digital and all the other channels. Secondly, digital strategies allow us to measure impact across the stages of change. So two of the speakers today aligned their indicators with results along those stages of change. And um, digital really allows us to address those critical decision points from knowledge to intention to action. And then last, um, I think digital 
clearly allows us unprecedented scale and efficiency. In many of the examples, um, you quickly and efficiently reach millions of people, uh, as with the Zika campaign and COVID-19. And in terms of efficiency, I, you know, we are really at a time when donor resources are diminishing and country leaders, particularly in low and middle income countries, need to make decisions about program resources. So digital communication strategies offer us a way to continue SBCC in a, you know, sustainable, cost effective and, and also a safe way. So. Um, I want to move on to questions, uh, and if our presenters can all make sure that they're they're unmuted. Let's start with um, let's start with Kate. Kate, is there uh, one question? Is is there any part of the Zika approach that you would change for COVID nineteen SBCC campaign in the U S. Oh, um, so. It of the Zika campaign for COVID. Well, you know, one of the things that kind of a similarity between the two is realizing, you know, the media has a lot of messaging that's taking place. And just as with Zika that, you know, there was an overall awareness. Um, but I think, I think using similar either geographically targeted or just targeted messages to an audience with a specific action that you'd want to take. I think there's um, definitely the similarity there. Um, in terms of differences um, that we do, um, gosh, it's, um, you know, there's so many similarities and yet definitely differences. I think, you know, people, given the current climate where we're all using digital and we're, um, you know, very connected right now, I think that continuing to use digital, I certainly wouldn't probably put up billboards, you know, and use the out of home um, tactics that we used for Zika that I think were effective. I wouldn't be using those um, for COVID right now. Great. Thanks, Kate. Uh, another question, we'll ask Emily to respond. Emily, um, what do you do in the middle of a campaign when you have to change your key message? And what uh, if the new key message may contradict your previous one? That's a great question. Um, and I would say that particularly in Haiti, it wasn't so much that we had to change our message, but that we just kept adding messages, right? We'd have um, a natural disaster and we'd have to sort of pivot from our uh, regularly scheduled family planning and maternal and child health messaging to then suddenly start talking about, you know, where you can find water stations and things like that. So, you know, I think we tried to keep our messages pretty much lined up so that there wasn't too much conflicting information. Um, but I think that I think frequently people will need to pivot and um, discuss a new topic. I think one of the important things to do before you change your message uh, is really to establish that trust base. Um, so really make sure that your audience knows who you are, knows when they can expect the messages, that people get a lot of random content on their phones these days, ads, scams, et cetera. Um, so you need to make sure that you have sort of an established connection uh, with, um, with your audience so that when you do need to change your message um, or a message comes at a time that they're not expecting um, or in a, maybe in a different format or said something a little bit contradictory, um, that they, you know, your audience can accept and sort of roll with this new, um, this new message. Because, yeah, I think we, we did have to change messages quite frequently. Um, but we had that initial uh, connection with our with our audiences. And, and another thing to add to that, mm -hmm. oh, Go ahead. Sorry, Alicia. I was I was going to add that using social media um, to test the messages is something that we found really useful. And you know, you will get people responding and likely um, you know sharing information about what might be complicated with understanding your message, and that can further help you refine it. 
Yeah, and actually, one thing I feel like we would be remiss without uh, if we end the session without talking about the principles for digital development. Um, Emma alluded to one of them, designing with the user, user-centered design. But these are nine principles uh, that are really important to consider when you're developing any kind of digital campaign or digital uh, strategy. Things like be collaborative, reuse, re uh, reuse and improve. Um, and design for scale. So definitely I would recommend to the audience to use these principles when designing your um, channels and content. Great. On a, on a relate, I mean, I think this is a related note. There was a question about disinformation and how to combat disinformation campaigns. Um, and curious whether the panelists have experience in encountering disinformation. Maybe, Emma, do you have any experience in that so far with your 321 COVID-19 campaign? Yes, that's a great question. We are actively working with partners on the best way to combat misinformation. Of course, it's different in each community, so a lot of the work we're doing is working with uh, oftentimes media partners to make sure that the source is correct and that the myths that we're kind of defunking are the most prevalent in the community. So say, for instance, um, in malaria in Uganda, we've had a lot of misinformation about malaria medicine or if you've been treated for malaria, it means that you are immune to coronavirus. So we've been trying to host information under 321 about COVID of common myths but we're also trying to make it more engaging. So we've recently developed a gamified content, we call it a Wanji game, which is kind of a choose your own adventure style game where the user can make their own choices and a lot of times they're going to be up against very common misconceptions about COVID. So maybe they think, oh, I'm, I can go out, I've had malaria before, I'm immune to coronavirus. And when they choose to go out, the game will say, actually, you are not immune to coronavirus. You should follow the quarantine rules and stay home to stay safe. Uh, so this is something we're constantly working with our local partners on. So interesting how, you know, the the use of, uh, you know, that the, these disinformation gets mutated um, globally. So last question, Emma, um, how do you evaluate the effectiveness of the 321 line to disseminate information, um, particularly around COVID-19, but in any way, how do you evaluate the effectiveness? A great question and one that we are constantly talking about and uh, iterating at the MO. So I would say the first thing that we usually do is we believe in constantly trying to understand more about the people we're trying to reach. So we push out a lot of different surveys and we can embed mobile surveys into 321 with IDR to be able to conduct kind of end line and baseline assessments of has this knowledge, has this new information increased your knowledge? And we can tailor that for COVID-19. So for instance, we could push out a survey that said, uh, are you staying home and follow, following quarantine rules? Uh, do you have a mask, et cetera? And one thing that we've recently been utilizing a lot for health services is an e-voucher program. So for instance, we could partner up with a health facility and on our messages on 321 say, if you, are, if you don't have a mask and you're interested, you can get one at this local health facility and we'll have some incentive, like an airtime transfer or maybe a financial incentive. So we'll send them a voucher. So if someone goes to the healthcare facility to claim that mask, uh, we'll be able to track that in the BMO platform and be able to see, okay, someone listened to this message, they wanted to get a mask, they took action. But it's really dependent upon the community and the partners we're working with, and we are constantly trying to think through what's going to be the most effective strategy to track this, this type of information. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. I, there are so, I could easily talk to all three of you for another hour, but unfortunately, we're at the end of our hour. There has been, there's been so much great information and detail from all three of you, and I thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone who joined today and for submitting all your great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, and I hope that everyone got some great ideas about how to implement digital strategies. I know I did. Um, and we'll be sending out a recording of today's webinar uh, next, early next week, and um, so be sure to watch uh, in your email boxes for that. Thank you all again. Um, Stay safe, stay connected, and have a great rest of your day.